Marlo Moss, who's the subject of today's talk, is famous for having said art, as life, is always in a state of becoming. What she's referring to there is the radical transformation that each new phase of life and artistic practice can bring to an individual. This is particularly fitting for Moss because she's someone who has undergone a tremendous amount of drastic and radical transformation over the course of her life. So a little bit of background on who Moss is before, or was before we get into looking at some of her paintings. Marlo Moss was born at the end of the 20th century to a middle-class Jewish family in London, England. When she was about 30 years old, she went off on her own into the English countryside and later emerged going in Marjorie Jewell Moss, her given name at birth, and coming out Marlo Moss. With this radical name change also came a change in gender presentation. She cut her hair incredibly short and she started wearing men's clothing and out in public would often pass as a man. She would later move to Paris in search of a community of people who were more like her, where she would meet her lover and ultimately life partner, another woman whose son they would raise together as their own child. While in Paris, Moss meets Piet Mondrian, who becomes her mentor, and she actually has a profound influence on him as well. So one of the most lasting legacies of her work is this double band um, that you can see here in this composition. Mondrian worked in a very similar style to how Marlo Moss worked, and Marlo Moss adapted that style and transformed it for her own needs, but Mondrian was very reluctant to include two parallel bands that were doing the same operation. But Moss had, including the, had included them in her paintings and brought a sense of dynamism and movement that Mondrian realized was missing from his own work. And so he incorporated that double band into his work as well. This has become one of the main reasons why Marlo Moss is remembered today, which is both very exciting because it gives us a look into the tremendous amount of influence that this woman had, but also flags one of the issues with recovering female artists who have been lost to history. And that is we often only justify their existence in an artistic canon in relation to the success of other men, male artists. And so Marlo Moss is someone who, in addition to the way that she transformed the work of Piet Mondrian, was an important and radical artist in and of herself and in her own right. And that's something that I really want to focus on today. So stepping back to her background again, after meeting Piet Mondrian, World War II breaks out and she has to leave France to go work and live in Holland. And this is an incredibly diff difficult time for her and eventually she ends up going back to England during which she challenges herself to continue creating even while isolated from her community and family who are back in Paris. Um, and while she's in England living out the war, her entire studio and collection of works were destroyed in air bombings. And so there's very little of Marlo Moss's work actually left which makes it quite difficult to study her in an in-depth way. But after the war, she created a whole slew of new paintings to try and replace and replicate the things that were lost during the war. So now I want to turn for a minute to this painting. Uh, this is an untitled work that uh, is currently at the Tate, um, but not on view. So this is really the only opportunity we have to think about it and look at it. And so there are three main things that Marlo Moss is thinking about in her paintings. She's thinking about space, movement, and light. So first let's talk about space. And for a minute we're gonna to talk to, about this double band that she has become so famous for. In all of her compositions like this, she has meticulously mapped out exactly what she wants to do. There's nothing here that's incidental. Everything is carefully measured and written out with compasses and rulers to make sure that the distances and proportions are exactly correct. The white here is emblematic of empty space. It's space that needs to be filled with structure of these solid black lines and colors, like the primary colors we see here. Marlo Moss was participating in what is called the constructivist movement, which is the 
emphasis of the material production of artistic works in such a way that removes the individual hand of the artist and would later be replicable by other artists to achieve the same ideas. And so Marla Moss is very carefully calculating out each aspect of her painting and doing as little alterations as she can to the colors of the paint so that she is removing herself as a subjective agent from the work that she is creating. So we just have this white blank space that is strategically uh, segregated by these black solid lines. And that limits the way that we're able to experience the space. And particularly when we talk about these double bands like the one we see here, it creates a sense of tension that these black bands are holding in the white band over here and the white band is struggling to be released from it. So we've talked about space and in that way we have also talked about motion, the struggle of this white band to um, get break free of the black bands. Now let's talk for a minute about light. So light and color are inextricably linked from one another, linked to one another. Um, the colors here represent the different levels of light that are bouncing off of the painting and hitting your eye. Um, and the primary colors, she works almost exclusively in white, black, yellow, red, and blue. Um, the primary colors are equidistant on the color wheel and in that way metaphorically represent all of the colors collectively brought together. But we can't really talk about light without talking about one of her relief paintings. So here we have one example, white with bent cord. And it's exactly what the title describes it as. We have a white canvas here, emblematic of an expansive space that is not broken up with black lines, but with white cords and white strings. And here, light and movement are brought into one another to create a dynamic sculptural art piece. So as the light moves around the space in which this work is displayed, the shadows cast by these bands and cords moves. And so we've created a dynamic relationship between movement, space, and light. Now the last thing I want to say about this gets back to Marlo Moss's personal biography and also gets back to her relationship with Mondrian. Mondrian was working in a theosophical framework, which was a spiritual religious uh, ideology in which op opposing forces need to be balanced. And two opposing forces are male and female. And male forces were represented in Mondrian's work in the vertical and female in the horizontal. And the two were balanced when they intersected or when they met at a perfect 45 degree angle. Moss much to the dismay of Mondrian, incorporates these diagonal lines into her work and these curves. So diagonal lines that do not perfectly um, balance a vertical and a horizontal and curved lines that totally ignore the vertical and horizontal. And these lines have been, come to be known as queer diagonals. So they reflect back on her own sense of radical transformation in the sense that she has been able to transform um, a very masculine artistic articulation and use a masculine vocabulary to be able to represent feminine and queer ideas. And so she's bringing in, using Mondrian's language, also ideas about queerness and representation that are embedded very subtly but quite effectively in these diagonal lines. These lines that go behind the thick and clear cords um, that would traditionally be the feminine, but also cut through them. And these curved lines that have no particular sense of being vertical and horizontal and are able to bisect at imprecise angles with the queer diagonal. And so in this way, Marlo Moss has been able to recapture the artistic language in which she's speaking and radically transform it to fit her own needs.